brief uh, technology overview into the uh, Aspera, uh, kind of the key technology behind Aspera, and that's the the Aspera Fast Protocol that sort of underpins everything as a as a level set for everybody. Um, just as a sort of reminder about this, the the key challenge that uh, that Aspera solves around file transfer is that uh, current um, protocols that you may have used before to, to move data around, you know, things like FTP or HTTP or RSync uh, are all based on TCP down at the lower layers, uh, which is what gives, you know, the reliability and, and all of those good things. Um, but there is a uh, an inherent bottleneck in the way that TCP specifically was designed. Uh, you know, this little 3D graph in the back corner here, this would be a typical TCP style transfer you know, let's say in your own data center. In other words, there's gonna be very little packet loss. Uh, there's gonna be very little latency, you know, that round trip time in between the sender and receiver. And in that situation, you can get pretty decent throughput. Uh, the challenge comes in when you start going over longer distances, you know, sending across the country or, or sending around the world, um, or just going over, you know, congested networks, right? If you're going over public internet, let's say to a cloud provider, uh, you know, there, there may be a lot of competing traffic and, uh, you know, the, the round trip time will, will increase a bit. There's some potential for packet loss in there. And that's really where, where TCP just by design starts throttling back and, and has the poor performance. Um, so the, the Aspera answer to this and the way that Aspera has solved this problem is with this new protocol uh, called FASP, F-A-S-P, uh, the Fast Adaptive Secure Protocol. Um, this is built into all of the Aspera products, and basically it allows you to uh, go at maximum speed regardless of these underlying network conditions, right? So even if you have a lot of uh, latency, a lot of you know high round trip time in between the sender and receiver, or even if you have a significant amount of packet loss, uh, the Aspera protocol can still very efficiently use the rest of that available bandwidth uh, to get you maximum performance. Uh, there are the uh, the things you would expect also built in here. So uh, things like reliability, you know, being able to resume even from the middle of a transfer if you have a disconnect, uh, playing nicely with other traffic, so congestion avoidance or being able to set specific policies on how fast Aspera goes, uh, that's all built in as well. And of course, uh, security is all a big part of this, right? So everything from, you know, not only just the application layer and uh, being able to to lock down who gets access to your content, uh, but also at, at a core protocol level, uh, there's encryption over the wire, for example, for uh, every every bit that's sent across, and, and that's all just sort of built in. Uh, just another sort of illustration about the uh, uh, about the performance aspects of Aspera. One thing I like to point out here. Um, is the uh, sort of the, the the way that Aspera has tackled this, you know, via this this new protocol, it, it makes it very predictable, right? So if you think of you know legacy transports where you start, you know, getting larger file sizes or getting longer distances, uh, those types of transfers often become impractical. Uh, with Aspera, they they are very practical. They're also predictable. Um, the Aspera protocol isn't doing anything as far as like, you know, relying on compression or caching or dedupe. So it doesn't matter whether the data has been sent before, whether it's compressible or not. It really sort of reduces it to a math equation of, you know, how much data do I have to send across the top here? How much available bandwidth do I have to send it? And you can calculate out what those transfer times look like. The other thing you'll notice is it is very linear, right? So as you start increasing the amount of data that you're sending or varying the amount of available bandwidth, uh, it's it's a very uh, linear equation as far as like what that does to your transfer times. You know, 10 times the bandwidth means a 10X reduction in that transfer time. At the same time, you know, increasing the, the file size by 10X is a direct uh, 10X increase in that transfer time. Okay, uh, so uh, as we've mentioned, Aspera, uh, you know, has this protocol. Um, how do they actually make it available? So just sort of in, in a, a general uh, 
kind of a, a top down kind of look at things. It's a very modular kind of system and and we're going to be getting into all of these uh, modules today. Uh, but uh, you can think of it uh, in this sort of layered fashion where, you know, at the bottom here is this a spare protocol I've been talking about. This is consistent across all of the software that we're going to be looking at. Right, so it doesn't really matter if you're on prem or in the cloud. It doesn't matter if you're doing a server to server transfer through an API call or you're coming in through a regular web browser as an end user. The underlying fundamentals are always the same. You know, you can get that same high performance, uh, same security and, and reliability uh, through that sort of ad hoc transfer. Uh, through your web browser as you can, you know, doing something very complicated on the command line, for example. Um, in the middle part of the slide is this uh, the sort of notion of the, the, you know, the transfer cluster or transfer server. And this is sort of the main engine uh, behind Aspera that can be deployed either on-prem, it can be deployed in a, you know, public or private cloud provider, uh, and it can also be, you know, managed in a couple of different ways, right? Um, you know, talking about customer managed versus uh, uh, versus a SaaS offering, for example, uh, that we'll get into in more detail in a bit. Now, sort of layered on top of this transfer cluster idea is, you know, how does this actually get get implemented to to kind of fit in for your use cases? You know, whether this is something like a delivery you know, final package delivery uh, to, uh, you know, for distribution or something more collaborative uh, between end users earlier in the pipeline. Uh, there's a number of different software options from Aspera that, uh, that uh, kind of fit in here and take this underlying technology and, uh, and, and make it work in your particular use case. And really that's, uh, that's one of the main things, uh, of course, that we wanted to to kind of get done today is to give you some introduction to that so you can sort of see, you know, as you come across these different use cases or challenges that you have somewhere in your file based workflow, uh, you know, look, there's there's all of these different options from Aspera on, on how to help solve that. You know, what's the way that's going to make most sense or just kind of keep it in the back of your mind, you know, once you have that information. Look, I, I remember Jason told me something about this. Um, you know, there, there's a workflow or an application from a spare that could fit in that workflow. Let's uh, let's let's explore that a little bit. Okay, uh, so with that said, uh, let's uh, let's hop into some of the specific software products. As I mentioned, uh, I'll be going through a few slides, but also breaking out for demos uh, as we go through this. Um, I've tried to sort of chunk it up so that it's uh, uh, not too overwhelming. I know it's a lot of information we're going to be throwing at you, uh, but also chunk it up so that it, it um, uh, some of the components that work together and, and kind of attack uh, use cases in different ways uh, are, are sort of held together. Um, so let me go ahead and move forward here. So kind of an eye chart here, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of pieces, uh, but sort of an overview of uh, some of the components that we're going to be looking at today. Um, I won't go into details of all these, but you know, in this particular slide, and by the way, we will share, we will be sharing all of these uh, after today's meeting so that you can have them for your reference. Uh, this sort of uh, looks at some of these components in a, um, you know, kind of, kind of in, in a use case or, or, um, you know, workflow type of fashion, right? So things like uh, the centralized administration, there are a couple of options there that we'll be looking at, um, a spare on cloud as well as a spare console. Um, in some of these cases, by the way, uh, the, the, the differences are um, either in how the deployment looks, in other words, SaaS versus on-prem, or, or maybe, you know, what the, what the particulars of the user interface are like. Uh, transfer and distribution. So this is sort of that middle layer, the Aspera transfer server that you can run and have as a customer managed option, either on-prem in your data centers or in the cloud environment. And alongside that, uh, we'll also be looking at Aspera on cloud, which is a full SaaS offering from IBM Aspera that, uh, that gives you the same sort of uh, uh, performance and, and capability 
from a sparrow without having to deal with all of the underlying infrastructure, if that's something that makes sense for you. We'll be taking a look at a sparrow sync, which is a server to server capability that adds uh, sort of a layer of statefulness to your Aspera transfers. In other words, you know, this is really about keeping uh, file sets uh, replicated and synchronized across uh, uh, across multiple locations, um, not just you know pushing files back and forth in an automated way, but keeping track of what's already been uh, sent and uh, looking for changes, looking even for deletions that need to be uh, replicated out to the other side. Uh, moving over, we'll touch on Aspera Orchestrator, which is a platform for uh, creating and executing file-based workflows. So typically, this is either you know what happens uh, before an Aspera transfer or after an Aspera transfer, right? Uh, if if somebody sends you a file via Aspera and you want to automate part of a workflow around that on on what happens next, Aspera Orchestrator is the tool that can help with that. Uh, for sharing and collaboration, we're going to be going over a few of these different options here. Uh, Spara Shares and Fast Specs are, uh, are long-time web applications that are customer-managed from Aspera that give different user experiences through a web browser um, for high-speed file exchange. And then the other piece of that is the Aspera on Cloud offering I mentioned. Uh, this is sort of the, the front end versus the back end on the left-hand side here as far as the SaaS offering goes to where there's a, a very nice modern web interface uh, that you can attach any of your either customer managed or Aspera managed Aspera servers to uh, in, a, in a simple SaaS uh, type environment. Okay, uh, so let me go ahead and move forward. Um, a, a couple of things I did want to uh, briefly touch on, and again, I'm trying to sort of layer this to, to help uh, make sense of things as we move forward here, um, is the direct to cloud capability that's inside of the Aspera software. Um, this is something that's available both in, in customer managed transfer servers, as well as uh, the Aspera on cloud SaaS you know, managed service offering. Uh, this is something that's pretty unique to Aspera. Uh, so we want to make sure you guys are aware that this is a capability that you have access to. Uh, and that's the, you know, the sort of this notion of working directly uh, with the native object storage in the various cloud platforms, right? So you can think of this on the right-hand side as, as native object storage, like, you know, S3 storage in Amazon or blob storage in, uh, in, in the Azure cloud, uh, IBM cloud or, or, you know, Google cloud object storage as well. Um, in a general sense, the, the way this works is uh, there's a, a compute instance or instances, if you're scaling out, uh, running in the cloud provider uh, that acts as a sort of storage gateway to the object storage on the back end. Right, so if you think of a, a client here on the left-hand side using the Aspera Fast protocol over the internet, it makes the connection into the compute instance and then nothing lands here on disk or anything. In memory, uh, this Aspera compute instance uses the native object storage APIs on the back end to read and write directly to, for example, your S3 bucket. So, you know, a couple of, uh, a couple of things that, uh, that we wanted to point out about this, you know, first of all, it does not land, none of the content lands in the, uh, in the EC2 instance. Um, Everything is line speed, you know, the way that Aspera always is. So you can still go at very high um, uh, bit rates, uh, even over the internet directly to object storage. And everything lands in object storage as a native object, right? So this is not something where it's a specialized container or anything that, uh, uh, or format that Aspera is laying down the objects at. You know, if you're uploading something to your blob storage in, in Azure, and you want to use another, you know, let's say Azure native process uh, to do, um, you know, whatever that next step of the pipeline is, uh, it'll be able to, to access that directly. Um, uh, sort of alluded to this earlier, but this is available in, in both of the models. So this could be a customer managed uh, instance 
in your VPC that you run and just lay the Aspera software on top of. Um, as part of the Aspera on cloud offering, uh, this is also available as a SaaS, uh, as a SaaS offering, right? So you can essentially bring your own storage and allow the Aspera managed EC2 clusters uh, access to it via an IAM role uh, so that your end users will be able to send through those clusters and land directly on your object storage. So again, sort of a nice option here uh, where you don't have to deal with this middle part of the infrastructure. Uh, you can bring your own cloud storage and uh, just use a spare for that high-speed transport. Okay, uh, moving along, there is one uh, additional piece of software we wanted to mention here, the Aspera Transfer Cluster Manager. Uh, this is an offering from Aspera for, uh, for groups that are uh, wanting to maintain their own cloud storage uh, clusters and have it available in, in sort of an auto scale type of uh, a fashion, right? In other words, if you have uh, peaky type of workflows, uh, where you'd want to scale out the compute instances running the Aspera software, um, you know, based on, you know, load that's varying, uh, you know, day by day or week by week or what have you. Uh, the Aspera Transfer Cluster Manager is the uh, piece of software that lets you do that. Um, basically, it allows you to set up a, a scaling group that handles all of the Aspera specific uh, clustering needs uh, under the covers. Right, so there are, for example, or there is a, a persistence layer, you know, an in-memory database that needs to be shared across all of the instances. Um, if your current servers are running low on capacity, uh, the Aspera Transfer Cluster Manager will spin up an additional node, um, add it to the availability group for new client connections coming in, uh, but also take care of this persistence layer under the covers. Uh, there are, of course, policies that you can put in place through ATCM. That's the Spare Transfer Cluster Manager as far as, you know, how many servers that you want to have available, when to auto-provision new ones as far as a, a capacity standpoint uh, goes and, and what the limits on that are. Um, it also takes care of deprovisioning servers as they start to go idle and you you come off of that, uh, that peak area of usage from, uh, uh, from a performance standpoint. Okay, uh, well, let me go ahead and, and start, um, now that we have sort of these uh, these basics and the cloud basics uh, taken care of, I'd like to get into some of the details on these these core pieces of Aspera software, and then we'll hop out for a, uh, a quick demo of some of these interfaces here. I'm not gonna read all of these, uh, uh, of course, uh, we will, as I mentioned, be providing these slides after the fact for your reference, uh, but one of the fundamental fundamental pieces uh, that I've alluded to already is the uh, Aspera high-speed transfer server. So this piece, this is uh, uh, the, the main engine of Aspera software that everything sort of builds on top of. Uh, Aspera high-speed transfer server can be deployed on-premise. It can be deployed in the cloud using that direct-to-cloud technology I mentioned. And as I said, this can be used either for server-to-server -server type transfers, but also as a building block for some of the other uh, Aspera products uh, like the web applications uh, that, uh, that allow users to come through a web interface. One of the things that we uh, will we'll show you in just a, a few moments here is that uh, you know, the, the transfer server, of course, can also act as a client. And this is a pretty typical uh, type of scenario or workflow for, especially in, the, in, in sort of the, the automated uh, types of data transfer uh, workflows where you could have two or more transfer servers, let's say in your different data centers uh, for internal transfers, or maybe you know you're working with a partner that has their own Aspera transfer server. Um, having this this piece of this core piece of software installed will allow you to initiate those transfers. Uh, to other Aspera servers, and it allows you to accept those inbound connections uh, from folks with, uh, you know, other folks with, with their own Aspera servers as well. 
All right. Um, now, layered on top of the, the core Aspera transfer server, uh, we did also want to introduce a couple of um, the customer managed Aspera web applications that you have available for you. Uh, the two are called Shares and then Fastbex. Uh, I'll go over both of these and then we'll show you a demo. Um, really, the difference here is what the workflow and use case looks like from an end user perspective. Aspera Shares is more FTP like. So, Shares is all about files and folders and giving end users access to those files and folders based on you know, what their credentials are, what permissions you've granted them. One thing that's sort of powerful about shares is that this single shares web interface can be in front of several Aspera nodes. And a node, going back to the last slide, is really just an Aspera transfer server somewhere in the world that, that you're managing. The reason this is powerful is because, you know, through that single Aspera shares interface, it means that you can um, have, have that one pane of glass, that, that one web app that a user can log into and they can get access to your Aspera servers, you know, East Coast, West Coast, something in AWS, something in another, another cloud, what have you, right? So through that single interface, um, I can do high-speed transfers um, and, and get my files from where they need to be to where they need to be without having to get into multiple systems. Now, Aspera Shares, like all of the Aspera web applications, uh, does support a uh, single sign-on through SAML. Uh, so, all, you know, all the things that you expect uh, from, a, from a web application, as far as that goes, there, there is very uh, granular access control in Shares specifically, and I'll be showing that in the demo in, in just a few moments here. So again, think of shares as, as useful for those types of scenarios, particularly around collaboration, where you need that, that kind of basic files and folders view. You can think of it as web FTP, uh, but you know, the, the key there being that it, it is, of course, Aspera enabled. So you're getting all of those benefits of, uh, of the Aspera protocol under the covers. Now contrast that with Aspera Fastbex. So Aspera Fastbex, again, this is a, a web application that sits on top of the Aspera transfer server. Um, the workflow is a little bit different in Fastbex. Fastbex is, is very much more about package delivery. In other words, instead of saying, you know, hey, log into this website, you're gonna see a bunch of files and folders that I've granted you access to. Uh, Aspera Fastbex is, I'm going to send you a package, a copy of these files and folders at a point in time. So as you can imagine, this is very useful for distribution type workflows uh, or really anything that's uh, um, even, you know, think of it as more email style. In fact, there are email notifications that are built into all of this, uh, but something where you would, you know, maybe think about sending somebody an email with an attachment of course, I want to send them like a 500 gig mezzanine file instead. That's not going to be able to go through email. You can send that type of package through Aspera Fastbex uh, and get all of those uh, so benefits of the Aspera uh, protocol under the covers uh, through this kind of package delivery uh, workflow. Uh, there are a ton of uh, other features inside of Aspera Fastbex, and we'll show some of those in the demo here in just a sec. Um, uh, it is actually also very heavily used for uh, ad hoc submission type of workflows, right? In particular, uh, especially if you're you're working with even non-technical users uh, that just need some way to to send you files, um, very large files, and and you know have the benefits of, of performance and security. Uh, there are some options inside of Fastbex that uh, that kind of give you that capability, right? So. Uh, and that, that sort of extends out to even asking for customized metadata about the package that they're sending, right? So, you know, click on this link, you're gonna attach whatever files you wanna send me, and I've customized uh, the form that you're gonna send out to capture some metadata 
you know, describing the package that you're going to send me. All that information is going to be captured in the system, uh, available for you as a recipient to browse through, uh, but it'll also be available um, as a as a sidecar file. So this is very nice for those sort of automated workflows where, okay, here's the package that somebody sent, here's the sidecar describing it, you know, let's get it into the pipeline and, and continue processing. Okay, I know I'm going uh, quickly through a, a ton of uh, different information here. Uh, we'll break in just a second to, to take a look at some of the things that we've uh, gone over so far. Uh, one of the things that we will be looking at, uh, you know, I've been talking a lot about the server side of things. Uh, there are also uh, several different Aspera client options uh, that we'll be taking a look at. You know, for the most part, uh, the, the most common way for end users to interact with Aspera software is through a web browser. Uh, so I'll show you what that looks like. The, the web interfaces like Shares and Fastbacks that I've mentioned all take advantage of an Aspera uh, plugin, uh, sort of a lightweight client that's installed and interacts with the web browser. Um, but uh, there are some additional client options uh, like apps for iOS and Android devices. As I mentioned earlier, another thing to keep in mind here, always using the Aspera protocol under the cover, so all of those benefits are always the same. Um, one client option that, that I will be spending some time on uh, during the demo coming up is Aspera Drive. So Aspera Drive is a desktop app for both uh, Mac and Windows that interacts with the various uh, Aspera web applications like Shares and Fastbacks, but also the Aspera on Cloud uh, SaaS offering. Um, it gives a way to uh, for, for end users who work with a lot of files to do these high-speed uploads, downloads, and, and even automate some of this directly from the desktop. So this is a very popular client option, and uh, I'll be showing you some of the options there, uh, particularly around FastBex. You know, if you think of that, that package sending model, uh, one of the really nice features that a lot of folks use a drive for just out of the box with even if they use it for nothing else, is that Aspera Drive can auto-download those FastBex packages that are sent to you. So great way to get those packages directly to your desktop without having to, um, to, to log into a web interface and download it, uh, particularly when you're talking about like working across time zones uh, or if you have a workstation, uh, especially nowadays, that uh, that may be remote where you want to have things automatically downloaded to, you're going to RDP in later to uh, uh, to keep continuing on with that workflow. Uh, and then finally, uh, on the client side for, for this sort of uh, set of applications I've been talking about so far, uh, there is also a command line client. And, and in fact, you know, the, the Aspera command line client, uh, you know, works for uh, FastBex, Shares, Aspera on Cloud. Um, this is an easy way to do some very simple sort of automation when you think about these web interfaces. You know, in a lot of cases, a web interface or one of these web applications may be sort of ad hoc and manual on one side of the equation, let's say when you're inviting outside parties to send you data, um, but you may want to do some automation on your side of things so that you're also not having, again, to go through that web interface. Um, the command line client is, a, is an easy way to get that done. Uh, you don't have to kind of dig deeper into the API level uh, to use the command line client. It's just something that you can script up or run uh, manually, again, on the command line to, to interact with those Aspera web applications that I've gone over so far. Okay, so as I said, I know I've been going over a lot quickly here. Uh, at this point, let me go ahead and break out of the slideshow. Um, I'd like to show some of these uh, interfaces that we've looked at so far. Um, and again, I'm gonna, show a, you know, a bit of each of them, again, to, to give you sort of an idea of not only what the interfaces look like if you haven't used them before um, and, you know, get you thinking about how we can use these in your various use cases, 
Uh, but always happy to follow up uh, later on and, and sort of dig into more detail on any one of these for, for smaller groups, you know, as you think about um, uh, kind of implementing these or, or how they can be used in conjunction with the rest of what you're doing uh, with your file-based workflows. Okay, so let me break out of there. Uh, the first one I'd like to show is that uh, Aspera, let me kind of declutter this a little bit, is that Aspera high-speed transfer server interface. Uh, now, as I said, uh, Spare High Speed Transfer Server. This is um, this is sort of the core engine uh, behind Aspera transfers. This can be installed on Windows, Mac, or Linux servers. Um, when you do install it on, you know, something like uh, my Mac, where I've got a GUI, it does have a nice GUI available here. And I think this is a nice way to to kind of quickly look and and see some of these capabilities here. Um, but all that to say that, uh, you know, keep in mind. High speed transfer server. I've got the GUI we're going to look at. This also does have a command line component underneath it. Uh, and there are also a set of APIs available for you to do this kind of integration um, with this, this core technology into your other applications. And in fact, it's you know it's pretty common, especially when you have automated workflows. Uh, to sort of install this on a Linux server somewhere and just interact with it uh, programmatically. Uh, now, that being said, I'm going to show you a Spera transfer server as a client here. Um, I've got it loaded on my Mac. Uh, the first thing I'll, I'll sort of mention, well, I guess just from a layout perspective, uh, if you haven't seen this before, it, it should look fairly familiar, uh, you know, basic file transfer kind of, uh, kind of layout where my local file systems are on the left-hand side. And then I've got a number of connections configured on the right-hand side. And if I take a look at any of these, you can see what that connection sort of looks like, right? So the host, this is just the DNS name or the IP address of the remote Aspera server that I'm going to be connecting to. And for those of you that, that haven't dealt with this before, um, one of the reasons I like to point this out is that any sort of underlying routing from a network per perspective, um, uh, Aspera is going to be all on top of that, right? In other words, I have this host name that I'm going to connect to. Um, whatever routing is in place from a network perspective, whether it's going over public internet or a private circuit or a VPN, uh, that's going to be invisible to Aspera, right? We're just going to try to make this connection out to the remote system, you know, via whatever networking is already in place. Uh, you'll also see I've got a username and password. So at the transfer server layer, at its most basic, uh, it's using uh, SSH uh, OS level authentication. Uh, so in this case, I've got a username and password. You can also use SSH private public key pairs. Now things get a little bit abstracted when you start using a spare web applications on top of this. Um, you know, essentially you use a service account uh, so you don't have to create OS users for everybody, uh, but just at, at the sort of core level, uh, you can think of these as just OS users. I'm going to connect into this Aspera demo server on the right-hand side. And as you can see, I can start browsing through uh, the directories that I have access to, right? So just a remote view of what's happening on the remote side of the server. Um, now, thinking about this in another way, uh, one thing to mention here, every user account that comes into an Aspera server um, has its own, what we call a dock root or absolute path. And, and that's important because it allows you to segregate all of these users uh, so they don't see each other's files, right? So if you have two different content providers, uh, let's say that are, are sending you files, you can isolate them into different parts of the file system. Uh, in this case, though, I'm just going to grab a couple of files and download them to my workstation. Uh, you can see in this case, I'm just downloading it to my desktop and some of the status at the bottom of the screen here. I'm going to click on the details button in the upper left and take a closer look. Um, you can see some of the statistics around these transfers as they're happening, right? You know, the ETA, how far we are in, how much is remaining. Uh, and also the, the network statistics. 
So I've got some pa or no packet loss, which is good, but I do have some latency. Uh, you know, I'm here in my office in Texas and I'm connecting out to this server in California over public internet. So 60, 70 milliseconds uh, of latency, it's about typical. As I mentioned, there is automatic retry and resume, not only here, but for all the Spiro software. So if you get a disconnect in the middle of a connection, it'll uh, it'll pick back up wherever it left off. Um, now, the other thing that's uh, you know more of a nuts and bolts thing, but is available in the, all the software is that you can specifically set your target rates. You know, I have this starting at 45 megabits. I can bump this up to say 300 megabits on the fly. You'll see on my little graph, it starts you know ramping up, trying to get to that that new speed here. Uh, so this is something that, uh, uh, of course, is built into all the software. Um, one thing to to think about, you know, as far as this goes, is if you are, you know, going to be um, hosting an Aspera server, um, you can set these policies for your users, right? In other words, you can put caps on how fast things are going. If you have a remote office that has limited bandwidth, uh, you know, you can set an aggregate cap so that Aspera no never uses more than, you know, however many megabits uh, of that uh, of that bandwidth that's available. Uh, but you can also set this at like a user or, or group of user level. So if you have higher or pro lower priorities, um, you know, let's say for, you know, things that are in production now versus, you know, archive type of transfers that are going on, you can set different priorities in the software uh, to allow those to go at different speeds. Okay, so again, very sort of straightforward here in the, in the transfer server. You know, I've downloaded a couple of files uh, to my desktop here. Um, and again, you can do this all on command line or via an API call as well. Uh, sort of a, a very basic type of <laughs> a spirit transfer uh, scenario. Okay, so as, again, as I, as I sort of went over in the initial slides there, um, I've got my transfer server. Uh, now let's take a look at a couple of the Aspera web applications that are available uh, for uh, that, that you layer on top of this transfer server. You know, in particular, Aspera shares and Aspera fastbacks. Uh, let me start with shares because that's where I started on the slides. Um, this is the Aspera shares interface. Very straightforward, right? Very kind of basic, as I mentioned, you know, web FTP style. Um, I've logged in as an administrator first because I do want to kind of show uh, one of the differences here. Um, as an admin, I can see everything, including these nodes. And again, just as a refresher, a node is an Aspera server that I control, or this could also be a SaaS, excuse me, a SaaS offering, uh, but that I have administrative control over. In this case, I have two different nodes. These are two, you know, actual Aspera servers um, that I'm administering. And from those two Aspera servers, I've got four different shares configured. And really a share is just a, you know, a, a folder on one of these nodes. Now the real power of, of the Aspera shares web application comes in, uh, even though it is sort of a, a very simple workflow here, uh, the, the real power is that you can have a very granular access control to all of these. You know, so I'm in as an administrator now, of course, so I can browse through them all. You know, marketing photo has a bunch of JPEGs. This marketing video share has a movie and a PowerPoint, and so on and so forth. Now, for my end users, um, I've granted very explicit permissions for each of these. And in fact, if I log out, as the admin and log back in as a regular end user, you can see the difference. So in this case, you'll notice I don't see the nodes at all. That's really just an administrative function. And of the four shares, I only see two of them. In fact, as I start kind of diving into these, you'll notice up top here, I also have different permissions on each of these. Right, so this marketing photo share, I only have download access. If I move over to Project Rocket, I've got download, upload, I can delete things. So these are all explicit permissions that have been granted to my 
end user or a group of my end users in um, for these specific shares. Now, everything I've been doing so far has been through the web browser, right? Just going over HTTPS. And as I said, this does support, um, you know, single sign-on through uh, SAML providers, as well as local user accounts. So totally configurable. When it comes time to actually transfer a file though, we need to switch from just using HTTPS in the browser uh, to using the Aspera protocol. Uh, the way that it works with Aspera shares, along with all of the Aspera web applications, is through the Aspera Connect client. Uh, the first time a user visits an Aspera-enabled website, if we detect that the client's not installed, we'll prompt to install it, or if there's an upgrade available, prompt to upgrade. In this case, I already have the latest version installed on my Mac, and you can see it here in the system tray, uh, this uh, this little C I'm hovering over, IBM Aspera Connect, right? So this is the Aspera Connect client that I have installed on my workstation here. Uh, just a quick FYI on this, uh, you know, it is fairly lightweight. It'll install into your home directory as a regular end user if you don't have admin rights. Uh, it works with all the major browsers. So IE, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, uh, on Windows and Mac, those are all supported, and Edge as well. <laughs> okay, uh, so as far as like the mechanics of it, if I go grab a couple of files and click on download, uh, we'll see a little pop-up window here. Um, the status here at the bottom as I'm downloading it, you can see some of the other transfers I've done previously. This little pop-up window, Aspera Connect activity, this is, uh, this is the Aspera Fast Protocol that I've been mentioning uh, here in action. So you can see how this is sort of a um, uh, sort of a hybrid type of uh, setup, right? The, the regular web browser for shares or whatever the web app is, and then the Aspera Connect client, which is actually doing the heavy lifting. Okay, uh, so this is Aspera shares. Again, think of this as that web FTP style um, back and forth. Now, the next one I'd like to, to give a quick introduction to is Aspera Fastbacks. Uh, Fastbex is the other major customer managed um, web application from Aspera. It sits on top of that same Aspera transfer server under the covers. Uh, but as I said before, Aspera Fastbex is more user to user or, or package oriented. And in fact, this new package screen, this is sort of the basic form that you would fill out uh, in order to send somebody a file. Now, there are a lot of security options that you can enable, disable, both site-wide and for you know, specific users in Fastbacks. I won't get into all of them, but you can do things, for example, like you know, allow users to, to send ad hoc submissions to somebody just based on their email address, right? In other words, they don't necessarily need to have an account if you allow that in your security policy. Uh, I have that set up here, so I can just type in somebody's email address, even if uh, you know, this personal email doesn't have uh, an account on the system. Uh, but I can type in, you know, review video for Wednesday. You know, attach a couple of files to it and click send. Pretty straightforward. It is that same, again, Aspera Connect uh, client under the covers, right? So just as you'd expect, always using the Aspera um, uh, technology underneath. Um, now, my recipient, in this case, you know, Jason Warman at Gmail, I'm going to get that email notification saying, hey, you've been sent a package, click here to download it. Um, one thing I do like to point out here, if you haven't used Fastbacks before, uh, there is some flexibility as far as this goes, right, which is very important when you're thinking about <laughs> a large package with, you know, gigs and gigs or terabytes of, of data. You can either download as a recipient the entire thing. Or if there's, you know, just one or two files uh, in particular, you can pick and choose all of those. Uh, by the way, this does keep directory structure intact, right? So if you have a, a whole hierarchy of folders under here, um, your end user will see that as well. Your recipient will see that as well.
Okay, uh, one last thing. Um, again, a ton of features in, in the spare fast specs, but uh, one thing I did want to point out uh, is that uh, that sort of ad hoc submission type of workflow. Um, there is a feature inside of uh, spare fast specs, uh, these work groups. There's a specific one called a Dropbox that is very useful for ad hoc submissions uh, or really any kind of submission um, coming to you via Aspera Fast Specs. Um, you can have multiple recipients as a member of one of these work, work groups. And one of the powerful things here is that you can invite outside submitters, again, let's say just typing in somebody's email address, and give them a custom link that comes directly to this Aspera Fast Specs Dropbox. In this case, I want to say I'm going to send Jason Warman a Gmail, an invitation. Um, maybe it's only good for a single upload, or maybe it's good for, you know, just a couple of days. You know, we're working on one specific little project over the next couple of days. Uh, but when you send this out, uh, this, uh, this outside user is going to get an email with that, um, uh, with that uh, uh, special link that allows them to go directly uh, to this submission um, page for your Dropbox. And the reason that's important, in fact, let me uh, let me bring it up in a in a new window here. This is my other browser that I just opened that link in. Uh, is that uh, you know it is ad hoc, of course, so it's nice to use for uh, this sort of collaborative, especially collaborative with with external parties. Uh, type of uh, uh, type of workflows, uh, but you can also customize this form, right? So we always have the title, you know, this is a you know spot submission, um, but you can have any number of uh, freeform text fields, or drop down options, or you know time date fields uh, that are basically collecting metadata about this. Uh, in this case, the spot that's being uploaded. So I can say this is going to be Jason W. This is a do not air before, do not air before the 31st. Play out patterns, channel A and B. And then just like normal, you know, I can grab any number of files and send it. So always using that same Aspera technology under the covers. Uh, but in this case, you know, now my packages as a, as a receiver here, I've got access to uh, the content. I've got the metadata that will be put in here as a sidecar when I download it as well. So we have a lot of uh, customers that are using this, uh, not only to see that metadata here in the web interface, but as I mentioned also um, uh, to, to have that capability of uh, doing some automated processing downstream. Okay, so we've taken a look at shares. We've taken a look at fastbacks. You know, I did mention a couple of the uh, the alternative client options, including Aspera Drive. So I do want to show that uh, real quick here. I have Aspera Drive loaded on my Mac, and uh, you know, one of the things that's important to think about, or, or you know, just to, to kind of wrap your head around, is that it it truly is an alternative client to these same web interfaces I've been looking at, right? So uh, I've configured my Fastback server. It's the same URL. It's the same set of credentials. You know, even if this is you know Okta or, or something uh, SAML provided, uh, you'll be prompted to to um, uh, to log in there. Um, but once I have this configured, I can use it directly on my desktop uh, with both of those applications. So first, I'll take a look at shares. So this is a spare drive with my shares uh, application. You'll notice I've logged in as my end user. So I've got those same two shares uh, that I have access to in the web interface. Now I have access to them via a spare drive. Right, so same files and folders under the covers. Uh, but now instead of going through that web interface, I can just simply drag and drop to upload and download. You know, I can take this little PDF, drag it to my desktop, you see the little pop-up, right? It's still using the Aspera protocol, um, but now it just uh, it just comes natively. So very nice tool, especially for folks that are working all day. Um, 
in Aspera workflows and, and want an alternative to having to go to the web browser every time. You know, the, the other option there is, uh, of course, you can configure this against Aspera Fastbacks. So you'll notice I have my inbox, um, my sent items, including that review video sent item that I just sent. <laughs> I can download these as well. Um, but one of the real powerful things I think I've sort of mentioned before is that you can also have uh, Aspera Drive work as an auto downloader for your Fastbacks packages. In fact, if I take a look at my preferences here under Fastbacks, you can see my packages settings. I have this configured to check for new packages every 15 minutes. And when I see a new package, download it somewhere on my local workstation. So we see this a lot, as I mentioned, uh, particularly working across time zones or if somebody is you know, sending you files in the middle of the night, uh, when you, when you uh, get back to your workstation in the morning, you don't have to go click on all those links and download them, especially if they're very large files. Uh, they'll be automatically downloaded as soon as, uh, as soon as they showed up in your inbox. Uh, so, a spare drive, a lot of options there. Oh, one other, uh, one other thing, uh, we'll get back to this in, in just a bit. A spare drive also works with a spare on cloud. So, we're going to be going over spare on cloud in the second set of demos here in just a bit, uh, but just wanted to introduce that. Uh, the, the other software option that I mentioned on the slideshow uh, is the Aspera command line client. Um, so that's not uh, super exciting to look at. I'll just give you kind of a quick taste of it uh, because it is on the command line. But this is basically something that you can, uh, you know, you can install on, uh, let's say, your your uh, Linux server and, and have run through cron or call this out through uh, through a different uh, type of uh, uh, type of workflow. So this works with both share, shares, fastbacks, and a spare on cloud. So I can do something like, you know, browse my Shares app. Net, and my username's you. So again, not super exciting to look at, but you can see here it's showing me as my admin user uh, the four different shares uh, that I had access to. I can also browse one of those specifically. So let's say Project Rocket. And then if I wanted to download something, uh, same kind of way, right? So I can say. Instead of browse, let's download from Shares app. My username's that, and then my source path is Project Rocket, and then you know this file, right? So you can see how this could be used for some very basic automation. You know there are APIs available for all of the Aspera. Uh, software options that we've been looking at, but something like this, where it's sort of a packaged uh, command line client, this is pretty nice in that you know you don't have to dig real deep into those APIs just to do some basic automation. Okay, so that is the first part of the demos that I wanted to go through. Um, let me switch back here to uh, to to take a look at uh, a couple of the additional software options uh, for Aspera uh, for the Aspera software. Um, one of these here, Aspera Fast Proxy Gateway. So this is an interesting piece. This is more of sort of an infrastructure <laughs> type of uh, component, um, but it is pretty heavily used. And really, this is a component from Aspera that adds a layer of separation uh, in between the internet. You know, typically the internet and your internal networks. So you can see the little diagram at the bottom here. You know, your spare transfer server that always has to be next to your storage, and typically that means it's internal on on a secure network somewhere. Uh, now, by policy, in a lot of organizations, you may not be able to uh, to expose this directly to the internet. Uh, so a spare proxy can be deployed in the DMZ, and really just acts as a network termination point. Right, so as clients come in, whether it's you know a, a, an Aspera server on its own or an Aspera Connect client because they're coming through shares or fastbacks, 
they first make a, a connection into the spare proxy in the DMZ, which terminates the network connection and then reestablishes a new connection directly from the proxy to the transfer server. So, you know, not, not super sexy to look at, but very important from a network separation standpoint. Um, this also works in reverse, right? So if you have a transfer server on your internal network that does not have direct outbound internet access, but you need to say deliver to another Aspera server with one of your partners, um, you can have it establish connections going through this proxy, which then has direct internet access. Um, just one thing to keep in mind here, again, no data lives on the Aspera proxy. This is really just a, you know, a reverse or forward style proxy that understands the Aspera protocol. Okay, uh, so Aspera console. This is, uh, uh, this is a, a really great piece of software, particularly for your on-prem deployments of Aspera transfer servers and you know, shares and fast specs and, and all of those things that we've seen so far. Console is a, um, a web application that gives you a real-time dashboard, that gives you historic reporting on all of your Aspera transfers. Uh, it's a way to have centralized configuration management of all of those Aspera transfer servers. And it allows you to trigger server-to-server -server transfers between or, you know, from or to your Aspera servers. So it really is, you know, from an operational standpoint, um, you know, sort of that central focal point for management, monitoring, and control of everything that's happening with your on-prem Aspera servers, or really, you know, even your in-cloud Aspera servers if they're customer managed. Um, now, from as far as an appointment standpoint, uh, we see this kind of go both ways, you know, for, for some organizations uh, or, you know, let's not talk about, you know, Warner Media wide, but but maybe even, you know, in a particular group or department, you can have a single Aspera console uh, that, um, you know, that, that has a mapping of all of your Aspera servers. Uh, there is role-based access control inside of console, right? So you can um, give end users with access to it you know, very specific permissions. Maybe they can just view the dashboards, but they can't change the config or kick off transfers, or maybe they can just like run one specific report or, or something like that. Um, we also see this in, in some cases at a more local level, right? Where a smaller group may have a console uh, because they're using it to initiate transfers. So as I'll show you in the demo, uh, in the web interface for Aspera console, you can initiate server-to-server -server transfers. There's also another API layer that's available for console uh, to do that same thing, which gives you some benefits for, from a uh, you know, failover and, and load balancing perspective uh, to be able to submit a job and have it, let's say, go to one out of you know, four sets of ser you know, four servers uh, that all have access to the content. So a couple of different deployment options there, but again, we'll, we'll, we'll see this in the demo. Think of Aspera console as that, you know, that one stop for anything related to management, monitoring, control, you know, historic reporting of what's going on with your Aspera software. Uh, one other piece I'll, I'll mention here, uh, this is a, again, a very powerful tool. This is an add-on to Aspera transfer server um, uh, it's called Spare Sync. And I think I sort of mentioned this earlier, but this is, um, uh, this is the piece that adds that statefulness to your Aspera transfers. You know, when we were looking at high-speed transfer server a few minutes ago, um, you know, I was doing some drag and drop type of uploads and downloads through my transfer server. I mentioned you could do that on the command line as well, or through an API call, uh, but Aspera Sync, keeps track of everything that's been transferred before, right? So this is, of course, super important when you have hundreds of thousands or millions of files. If you've tried synchronization with something like rsync, you'll know that 
you know, for, for when you get to these large uh, uh, file set sizes, even scanning through that source, that 300,000 files, that can take as long as like how long it takes to, to transfer what's new. And if you're running that, you know, let's say in a cron job every X number of minutes, you're going to spend a lot of time scanning through files for changes uh, before you even get to transferring files, which of course you'll run into that same uh, TCP type issue uh, that uh, that rsync and SSH have. So Asperasync um, keeps a little snapshot of what's been transferred already. So when it's looking for changes, it doesn't have to reach out over the wide area you know, to, to the receiving side to see if that file already exists and, and even make that decision on whether the file is new, whether it's different or changed or deleted and needs to be sent again. So this really helps in, in, you know, in two ways. Um, the first is the, the scanning for changes of your synchronization or replication workflow. And then of course, you know, the, the typical, you know, Aspera performance improvement just by using uh, the FAST protocol under the covers. Uh, a couple of uh, uh, ideas for you here. You know, you, you're probably pretty familiar with these as far as, you know, where Aspera sync often comes into play. You know, these are things like, you know, DRBC type scenarios or, you know, distributing content if it's gonna be played out locally, for example. Uh, or processed locally in different locations, um, or, or even something even a, a little more generic. You know, we see this a lot for working in different storage environments. You know, a lot of the SAN and NAS type of uh, um, options that you have deployed on-prem, they may have their own synchronization options, uh, but of course those will typically just work uh, between systems from the same vendor. So if you're having to deal with you know, one type of storage here and another vendor storage in a in in your other data center. Asperasync is a nice alternative that's highly performant, of course, uh, but that uh, doesn't care about what type of storage you have under the covers. Okay, well, with that said, let me uh, let me break out one more time and show you a couple of these pieces. Um, I'll bring up my browser here and take a look at Aspera Console. So. There are a ton of features in Aspera console. I'm gonna just quickly go through some of these here uh, because uh, there's so much to look at. But just as a quick uh, look here, I've got my dashboard where I can see you know, what's happening currently, uh, what's happened recently. You can see all of those, uh, those various uh, transfers we were doing in the first set of demos. Um, down below, you can see any errors, any problem transfer sessions. So you can imagine you know, from an operational uh, perspective, this is a good place to quickly look to see sort of what's happening now, what's the, the health of my system. Uh, if I dig into any of these, I'll click on it, you can see all of the very specifics that are available here, right? Not only the kind of the status for the session, but, you know, what's my source and destination IP addresses, all of the, you know, the, the individual file names, and this is searchable, by the way. Um, as well as the network statistics about this transfer session uh, as it was happening. You know, we can see in this case, I had some packet loss for whatever reason. Fortunately, with a spare, that doesn't uh, matter too much. But this is all the kind of detail that's, uh, that's kept inside of the Aspera console interface, not only for you to browse through interactively like I'm doing, uh, but also uh, there is this nice reporting engine that lets you either use canned reports or, or you know, build out your your own reports on uh, you know on what's happening uh, with your Aspera servers. Uh, by the way, just to sort of mention briefly here, um, all of these reports, the reporting engine is really nice. You know, th there are things like schedules, so you can say, you know, every week on Monday, run a report for last week, and then just email it to me as an Excel file or something. So it's a it's a pretty robust system. Um, in this case, I'm just going to say, let's take a quick look at what happened in the last hour or so. Uh, this is sort of a, a summary type of report uh, that gives some basics as far as like, you know, how much data was sent. You can see here IP addresses, number of sessions, um, uh, just to give you a quick idea of, of what some of these capabilities are. 
Now, the other piece that's uh, pretty interesting about console, and I won't go into too much detail about this, is but, but I mentioned you can use console to initiate server-to-server -server transfers. Now, you can do that in sort of a, a basic, you know, this, this simple transfer way where I pick out which files go from where to where. You can also create what are called smart transfers. Uh, this is a way to put something on a schedule, right? In fact, this one, you can see my nightly log archive. I have this running every day at 2 a.m. Pacific. You can see the next one's coming up. If I take a look at this, you can you can get an idea of what we're looking at here, right? So here's my source. You know, this is my console node, and the source is slash logs. I'm always going to transfer the entire directory to my destination, which is this web app node in the slash log archive. Um, uh, log, log, sorry, log archive directory. You know, there are a lot of other features here. I show you the scheduling, but there are also things like email notifications uh, for start, success, and errors um, that, that you might expect. Okay. Uh, Aspera Sync, I'm not going to show because it's uh, it's all command line, but I did want to mention that uh, Sync jobs also do show up here in the uh, Aspera console interface. You can see uh, this is a job I have running in between two of my um, two of my servers. If I click on it, again, kind of a, a quick look here, you can see the status. You know, I've got 23 synchronized paths. Nothing's pending right now, uh, but this is the kind of thing where you can say, you know, if I've got this uh, huge synchronization job um, that's going to run under the covers on the command line very simply, uh, but in this case, I can still come in through, uh, uh, through console here to, to get a quick look. Okay, um, let me move along here. I'm going to go through a couple of these briefly here because I know we're running uh, about 15 minutes uh, until uh, we're out of time here. Uh, but we did want to mention a couple of additional things. So Aspera Orchestrator, uh, I sort of mentioned this before. This is a web application uh, that allows you to design and then execute workflows um, for uh, for your um, your file-based workflows, right? So this, uh, for example, this is something that's looking for um, files that are being ingested. You know, you can see on my little screen here, it's running media info against it, doing a notify, calling a transcoder, um, sending through fast specs. Uh, the, the thing about Orchestrator is it's, it's really sort of a blank slate. Um, it's plugin based and has, I think, a, a couple of hundred different plugins now to interact at an API level, not only with Aspera software, uh, but with other applications as well. So here's sort of a sampling of the different application plugins that are available out of the box for you know anything from transcoding, uh, you know QC, you know something like that, and, uh, you know media asset management systems, of course Aspera transfers, uh, but other types of transfers as well. Or, or even, you know, updating a database or sending an email or a Slack notification. So very, uh, very powerful tool. Um, this is uh, this is used pretty widely for uh, highly automated workflows. And as you can imagine, you know, because Aspera is involved with, you know, typically either at the beginning or end of a workflow, uh, and many times, you know, what to do with that asset once it's been sent to you from Aspera or how to prep an asset and get it sent out via Aspera. Uh, there are a lot of possibilities here on, uh, on using Orchestrator to, um, to automate those, um, those types of uh, use cases. Again, happy to have deeper discussions on Orchestrator or really anything else that we've looked at today um, through uh, uh, you know, with, with a smaller group uh, after the fact. Uh, now, with that said, you know, one thing we haven't touched on yet, and we definitely want to make sure that we have some time for here, is Aspera on cloud. That's the SaaS solution from uh, from IBM Aspera, uh, which, which has sort of two different phases or two different aspects to it. Uh, the first is the front end. So here in the middle, Aspera on cloud, um, from a front end perspective, is a SaaS offered web application uh, that gives an end user experience. It's a very modern web app. Um, it, it takes some of those same functionality or 
or paradigms from fast specs and shares and collapses them into a single web interface for a spare on cloud. Now, the back end of this is where it really gets interesting from a hybrid perspective, because you can attach in the lower right hand corner your existing high speed transfer server that you run and manage either on prem or in your own, let's say, VPC into a Spira on cloud. But you can also use SaaS offerings from Aspera in Azure, IBM Cloud, Google Cloud, and AWS. So this is that scenario I mentioned to you before, you know, very early on, where let's say you have an S3 bucket in US West 2. You don't have to stand up any additional infrastructure. You can attach that S3 bucket to an Aspera managed uh, SaaS transfer cluster in US West 2 via IAM role and then attach that to a Spira on cloud. So very simple way of enabling um, hybrid workflows and cloud workflows, even across providers, uh, while still giving this nice modern web interface for your end users. Um, I'll show you this a, a bit in a demo in just a moment here, but as I mentioned, you know, both uh, the, the shares, files and folder style and Fastbex package style um, interfaces are, are both available in a spare on cloud. One thing that is sort of new, um, even for your, those of you that have, have been working with a spare on cloud in the past, is there's a new automation app, uh, which allows you to do some very basic uh, workflow automation directly within the Aspira on cloud interface. And I could show you uh, uh, this in just a moment here, but you can get a sense here of, you know, what some of the different uh, triggers are on when to, to kick off an Aspera on cloud automation. And then, you know, what some of the options are on what to do next, you know, are we sending as a package or, or moving an archive of a file somewhere, or even just calling an external API call uh, to, to help with the rest of your pipeline. Okay, so with that said, again, let me break out of, uh, of the slideshow and show you a spare on cloud. So uh, very briefly here, I've logged in first as an administrator. Um, I've got a couple of different Aspera nodes configured. Here's an Aspera built-in IBM Cloud Object Storage node. The second one is you can see it's it's local storage. It's hosted by me, you know, not Aspera. So this is a Linux server in my data center with my local storage attached to it uh, that I've attached here to Aspera on cloud. And then finally, this is the exact uh, uh, scenario I just described in the slide. This is one of my S3 buckets that I'm attaching uh, here in US West 2 using the Aspera managed transfer cluster. So now that I have all of these different node options available, I can expose these to my end users here in Aspera on cloud. Now, one of the uh, one of the key differences here or, or sort of concepts in Aspera on cloud is this notion of a workspace. You can take a look at a couple of these. I've done some light branding here. There is some branding available in AOC. Uh, a workspace inside of Aspera on cloud is a way to silo off uh, users and storage and you know, security policies inside of one Aspera on cloud organization. So in other words, this blue zebra creative, this can have a completely different set of users that has access to it versus default workspace. It can have completely different um, storage associated with it. And in fact, some of those security policies are different between these two. Um, you know, the reason I bring this up is that you know, we, we have some customers that use these workspaces on a project by project basis, uh, because let's say, you know, an internal marketing project, uh, you want to disable the option, let's say, to uh, share externally. But then a project where you're working with an outside agency or with an outside vendor, uh, you want you want to open that up. Uh, we also do see some workspace uh, layouts that are, instead of project-based, more departmental or group-based. Um, one of the things you can do inside of a workspace is delegate some of the administration. 
right? So without having to be a system-wide administrator like I am, I can create this Blue Zebra Creative uh, workspace and give manager access to just it, you know, to, for example, add and remove users or assign some permissions, um, but keep everything siloed in this one area. Okay, uh, so let me switch over. You'll see in the upper right, I have a uh, an app switcher, a couple of different apps. And uh, these are, as I mentioned, sort of analogous to the on-prem Aspera software that we looked at earlier, shares and fastbacks. Um, the files application is much more of that shares experience, right? Where I've got a number of different files and folders, uh, just again, based on what workspace I'm in and what permissions have been granted to my user specifically uh, by an administrator or manager. In this case, I've got three different uh, folders here. Um, what, one thing that's sort of interesting is that these are all on those different nodes, right? This one, if I look at info, um, this happens to be my on-prem node in my Austin data center. Uh, if I look at this Oregon project, uh, this is that AWS US West 2 bucket. From you know, from my perspective as an end user, I don't necessarily need to know that or even care. I just see the files and folders, you know, regardless of whether they have where, where they happen to live. Uh, the actual uploads and downloads uh, work very similarly in that it still uses the Aspera Connect plugin. You know, if I download uh, you know this trailer here, um, it's going to use that same Connect plugin from an end user perspective. Um, the, the user experience is a little bit more streamlined. So you can see here in the upper right, I've got the, uh, the status. It's actually in, in page here. This is a single page app. So I don't have that separate pop-up window showing me my progress, uh, even though it is using that same component under the covers. Okay. Uh, one last thing to briefly show here is this uh, split view. Now this is sort of interesting in that it enables server to server and cloud to cloud transfers even as a regular end user right so on the left hand side i'm in my austin you know on prem incoming folder on my right hand side i'm going to go into my oregon s3 bucket and i can drag and drop between the two right so i can you know take a couple of files here this one this one drag them like this and this is going to initiate a server to server transfer, in this case from S3 to my on prem server um, directly. You know, I don't have to download these to my workstation just to re upload them on the other side. Okay, uh, so the other application I wanted to, to briefly touch on here is packages. This is more like a spare of fast specs as far as, uh, you know, kind of the, the paradigm that, that users are, are using here. Um, this is more of that, you know, type in somebody's email address, um, you know, put in a subject, uh, test for JSON, and I can attach some files. Um, just like uh, just like fast specs, you know that there are some additional features here, including that option uh, to, for example, add metadata. And again, this can be customized for each individual submission box, shared in box that you have. But you can have any number of um, you know day date fields or drop down menus or freeform text fields. And again, these will all be available not only in the web interface here, uh, but based on a setting uh, that I've configured, this is going to be saved as a, a little JSON sidecar file. So if I wanna do some automation downstream with this package, I can do that. Okay, uh, very briefly, I'll just uh, quickly show, uh, there is transfer activity built into a spare on cloud here. So this is a way, uh, it's kind of similar to Aspera console, where I can look at all of my transfer activity, um, that's happening, you know, as far as like what the actual transfers are, volume usage is more like what, you know, what am I using from a storage point of view? Um, and for each of these, you know, you can drill in and see an overall view or look on specific nodes or a particular workspace or even a particular user uh, for, for a time frame. All right, so sort of that nice visibility aspect into your uh, Aspera on cloud environment. And by the way, this includes um, 
options for you know reporting this activity even for your on-prem nodes that you've attached to a spare on cloud. And then finally here in the uh, in the automation piece, uh, you know, I have a, a simple workflow here, uh, but again, you can see how, how this might be sort of interesting. In this case, I've got a shared inbox that's being used as a trigger. In other words, when a package arrives in this inbox, my content ingest for Project Lima, as soon as a new package arrives, uh, you can take uh, any number of actions. In this case, I'm actually doing a server to server transfer into this archive folder. Right, so this package is going to be available just as any package is through a spare on cloud. Uh, but in this case, I, I'm, I'm making a separate copy. This one happens to end up in Glacier, right? So even though I'm going to have the rest of my pipeline running as is, I'm taking, in this case, a, a separate copy and, uh, and sending it off for long-term storage in, uh, in the Glacier archive. <clears throat> 